it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our Building Bridges lecture series. My name is uh, Ram Ramas Brahmanian, and I serve as your Vice President for Research here at UVA. The Building Bridges lecture series is supported by the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Vice President for Research, the Global Infectious Diseases Institute, the Environmental Resilience Institute, the Brain Institute, uh, the Data, Data Science Institute, now School of Data Science, and the Biocomplexity Initiative uh, here at UVA. The goal of this series is to strengthen the culture of transdisciplinary research at the University of Virginia. The series highlights discoveries at the interface of disciplines that address the world's biggest challenges, building bridges between disparate areas of study, and connecting cutting edge research with the broader community. Our speaker today is Dr. Rita Caldwell, a distinguished professor at the University of Maryland College Park and Johns Hopkins University. She holds a BS in bacteriology and MS in genetics from Purdue University, and she has a PhD in oceanography from the University of Washington. Her research has focused on global infectious diseases, water, and health, and she has worked on issues around safe drinking water for both the developed and the developing world. She was the director of the National Science Foundation from 1988 to 2004, where she focused on K through 12 science and mathematics education, graduate science and engineering education, and increasing the number of women and minorities in science and engineering. I want to thank Dr. Caldwell especially for creating the IGERT traineeship program, one of the many programs that she created in NSF in 1998 and, and onward, that I had the privilege of managing from 2009 to 2012 and see hundreds of PhD students trained uh, exceptionally well uh, by their faculty members. Again, thank you, Dr. Caldwell. <clears throat> she has served as the president of the University of Maryland's Biotechnology Institute and as professor of microbiology and biotechnology at the University of Maryland. She has authored 19 books and more than 800 scientific publications and produced the award-winning film Invisible Seas. She has received 63, yes, 63 honorary degrees and many other accolades. Uh, every, every one of the big accolades I look, looked up, pretty much I saw Dr. Rita Caldwell's name listed there, so I just would not bother listing all of them. Uh, and, uh, but a few to mention, a National Medal of Science from the President, a Vannevar Bush Award from the National Science Foundation, and Chevalier de la Légion uh, d'Honneur from the Ambassador of France. It is truly an honor to have Dr. Caldwell speak to us today at UVA, especially in this amazing venue. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Caldwell. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'll paraphrase Mark Twain, who said, a few moments of compliments gives you a month of happiness, so now I have an eternity of happiness. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here at the University of Virginia amongst friends. I've been here before, and it's always a pleasure to come back. I'm going to talk today, um, and I hope I don't overwhelm you with too many slides, but I want to share with you the work that I've been doing over the last few decades on climate, water, and health. I had in initially suggested climate, oceans, and human health, but I think water is more appropriate after having spent some time here and learning of all the things that are going on. Uh, water, of course, is critically important because so many diseases are transmitted by water. Um, just cholera alone accounts for something in the order of um, a few billion cases every year, and it continues right now with the biggest epidemic in Yemen, and I'll speak of that in a moment. And certainly, uh, it ends up with a couple million deaths as well. So when you add up all the other diseases transmitted, it, it's formidable. Um, cholera, is, this is calls to Newcastle for many in this audience, but that's okay. It's an acute water-related disease. Um, we measure cholera in the various pandemics that have swept around the globe, and I hope that <clears throat> by the end of this lecture you'll agree, or at least you'll hear, that um, it's a naturally occurring bacterium in the aquatic environment. Uh, the bacterium um, causes disease in about 50 countries, and, and uh, anywhere between a few to several million people are affected. We've unfairly referred to the Bengal Delta, Bangladesh and India, as the native habitat, but frankly, when you go back through all the history and the, and the literature, um, 
we here in the U.S. until the 30s, 1930, uh, would have outbreaks of cholera. If any of you are hikers of the CNO Canal, the Monocacy Aqueduct has a uh, plaque that is states that is dedicated to the cholera workers who uh, died building the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. In fact, in the history, the uh, cholera workers would flee uh, in August and September to avoid coming down with cholera. So it, it is a global disease. And it exists naturally in the aquatic environment. Um, there are new biotypes. The 0139 has been um, um, a problem recently. And we now really understand that cholera can't really be eradicated, but it can be controlled. Uh, there are many ways of doing that, but especially by providing safe drinking water. Now, uh, again, coals to Newcastle, but for those of you who are not microbiologists, it's easily cultured uh, using a special medium. You can see the bright yellow colonies. And the bacterium uh, is a little curved rod with a single flagellum. Uh, the cholera patient doesn't appreciate the bacterium too much because um, uh, there's an excessive loss of fluid through vomiting and diarrhea that is crudely measured in some of the rural um, areas of uh, Bangladesh to determine the fluid loss because this, of course, if not ceased, it can uh, lead to death. I've done a lot of work in the Chesapeake Bay, and so the original studies were actually in the Chesapeake Bay. The work that I had done at the University of Washington was studying marine bacteria. I was um, the first to graduate in the new, uh, and I think the only at the time, marine microbiology uh, program at the University of Washington, and learned a lot about marine bacteria, and then had the opportunity to study Vibrio cholerae and find out it's an estuarine bacterium. It has an absolute requirement for salt. In fact, it, it blices and falls apart in distilled water. Uh, and the bacterium is found in the environment, but it's, it's associated with plankton. And we learned this in the Chesapeake Bay. We, back in the 70s, we were doing work, and one of my students, um, Dr. K now Dr. Kaneko, um, did the cycle of Vibrio, and we did find Vibrio cholerae in the Chesapeake Bay. It's still there. We obviously don't have cholera because we have safe drinking water. But this is a culprit. It's the um, Kalanis copepod in this case, and um, the bacterium is tends to accumulate on the egg sac, uh, and probably because of an evolutionary relationship, because the egg sac breaks, and the bacterium produces a very powerful lytic enzyme, probably contributing to the life cycle of the copepod. And, and very early on, we developed a relationship between plankton and the bacteria. Essentially, in the spring, uh, warming water, an abundance of phytoplankton, uh, measured by chlorophyll. And then the zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton. And then when that bloom crashes, then the bacteria are released into the water column and then find their way to those who drink water unpurified or untreated uh, can come down with a disease. One other finding that we made was very interesting. Uh, we noticed that when we used a staining technique, uh, the, the uh, green bars, there was a whole lot more Vibrio cholerae uh, then we could actually culture those are the yellow bars, which meant that there were bacteria there in much greater numbers than we could culture. And this led to understanding the phenomenon of non-culturability, which was very logical when you consider that the vector, and I consider the copepod a vector, uh, it just swims, it doesn't fly. Um, when you consider that the copepod goes into a diapause when it goes into the sediment, that is, it's a quiescence, kind of a dormancy over the winter. And if the bacterium is its natural commensal, then it would do the same thing. And that turned out to be the case. In fact, the bacterium does go into this uh, dormant stage. We called it the viable but non-cultural. Uh, the CDC not very nicely originally called it the Caldwell ghosts, but that was OK. <laughs> Now, now, now it's understood because of uh, DNA analyses that there are many, many more bacteria that we cannot culture. And in fact, many organisms do go into this dormant stage. Cholera is a global disease. And unfortunately, in Africa now is where the disease is most rampant and most difficult. But what's very interesting is there's a clear relationship 
to the environment. Sea surface temperature um, plays a major role in the um, uh, ascendance of a bacterium because it's very sensitive to increase in temperature. It's um, kind of a low temperature level. It's about 15 degrees. But sea surface height, also measured by satellite, uh, contributes because it's an estuarine bacterium and the tidal flow does have an effect on the distribution and the numbers of the diseases that occur. But it's related to plankton and the plankton flows and in the peaks and valleys of uh, plankton populations. And we were able to demonstrate this very nicely in the uh, Bengal Delta, where the, m many of our studies were done, because uh, those of you who have worked in Bangladesh know that there's a spring peak and then a fall peak. And that correlates very nicely with the population blooms. Now, I started my work in Bangladesh in 1975 and have gone back almost every year since. Uh, working with a team there, mainly in the in the uh, delta right near the in the Bay of Bengal, the um, the the habitats that is the availability of water to villagers is simply the the uh, ponds or the the um, areas where they draw water directly and drink it without filtration. Obviously, that's all they have. They don't have piped in water, and um, one of the things we did discover that indeed. Uh, by culture, the only important number in the slides is a zero under culture. Um, we would, in some of the places, we would find that we couldn't culture the bacterium, but by using a very elegant antibody ligated to um, uh, a stain, we could actually see them, even though we couldn't culture them. So there are many, many more of the bacteria present than you can culture, and often you can't culture when it's still present. So from the work in Bangladesh, it expanded the studies we had done in the Chesapeake Bay, and we found that, indeed, the bacteria are associated mainly with the copepod, but also we could pick it up in some of the other uh, plankton uh, species. Uh, and clearly, no, no denial, there's tremendous person-to-person -person con uh, con uh, uh, contribution, and most of the classic epidemiology works on the person-to-person -person contact, but you can't leave out the environment. The bacterium does derive from the environment, and the numbers are, are critical to understand. Now, one of the things we thought about back in 1980, this was 40 years ago, uh, it occurred to, to me that if chlorophyll could be measured by satellite, because Landsat satellite had been launched in the late 80s or the mid 80s, and it measured chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and sea surface height, which is the tidal fluctuation. And I thought, well, you know, if indeed we can measure chlorophyll in the spring and fall, it should be abundant because of those peaks in populations. And indeed, that's exactly what we found. We published this 20 years ago, showing that um, the measurement, the red is the cholera cases in um, Dhaka and in the Sundarbans. Uh, these are numbers of cases. And then the blue line is, in this case, the sea surface temperature. And there's been adjustment, that is, um, first there's an elevated temperature, and then there's a bloom of uh, chlorophyll, and then zooplankton, and then cases because the crash means that the bacteria are released into the water column. And so by adjusting for that six to eight week hiatus, that fits extremely well. So that was a very crude relationship by satellite measurement and sensors and being able to correlate with the outbreak of cholera in, um, in Bangladesh. We have improved the uh, modeling that we've done and studies that we've done in Calcutta and also again in, in Bangladesh. We've been able to show that with a milligram per cubic meter increase in chlorophyll, it correlates with about 33%, a third increase in the number of cholera cases. And we showed that with rainfall, which many people have shown some relationship, when, the, when there's a millimeter per day increase in rain, you get about a 7% increase in the numbers of uh, cases of cholera. And similarly, numbers were shown uh, to occur in, 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 um, um, in Bangladesh and uh, Calcutta in India. Um, we went back to the old data. We, we uh, were curious about these relationships because it, we had a sense that there was something different about epidemic cholera and what we now call endemic. Uh, along the coastline, 
you have spring and fall, almost without fail, cases of cholera increasing. But every now and then you have this explosive outbreak as occurs really inland. And so we went to the archives in England. This was work with a team um, with Elizabeth Whitcomb, a wonderful physician uh, scientist um, who um, um, had discovered these records in the uh, museum in London. So we were able to get the data in those wonderful huge maps with every single death recorded and all the other meteorological data transferred to the computer. And by looking at the inland data around Delhi, we were able to show a very interesting correlation, and that was very high temperatures would lead, obviously, to proliferation of the bacteria, uh, but that relationship, relationship of temperature was very, very critical. And we also found from the literature that rainfall was a major factor, um, and many other uh, factors have since been published. Uh, salinity plays a major role because the bacterium has a requirement for salinity. And in the Chesapeake Bay, you isolate, we were able to isolate Vibrio cholerae, the causative agent of cholera, mid-bay, because the salinity is about 15 parts per thousand. And so Vibrio parahemolyticus tends to be more abundant at the mouth of the bay. And unfortunately, Vibrio vulnificus does well somewhere between the mouth of the bay, ocean temp uh, salinity, and mid-bay. And I'll have a bit more to say about vulnificus because that's a real baddie. And we do have problems with that in the Chesapeake Bay. But we improved the model uh, with the initial data. And we now know that with increase in air temperature above average, the previous two months, coupled with very heavy rainfall, and coupled again with a damaged or a very bad sanitation situation, then you have a very high risk of um, cholera. So that's sort of the fundamentals of the model that we've been working with. And the question is, could we have predicted the Haitian cholera outbreak? Now, this was um, a massive outbreak in 2010. Um, associated with the earthquake, which occurred in the spring. Um, but what was very interesting is that the original case was um, at the mouth of the Atanibi River, uh, but very quickly thereafter, within a very short time, there were cases throughout the entire country. Uh, we've done some hydrographical studies, and it's really not possible for the speed of the river to have carried the contamination down in that period of time. This is controversial, but the interesting thing is that we were able to analyze on some of the cases uh, very early on and found that about 40% of the cases, uh, stool samples that we were able to analyze, carried mainly Aramonas and um, Salmonella and Shigella uh, and not Vibrio cholerae. So, there were other factors at work in that big outbreak. But the critical thing was, going back to the literature, digging into the archives, we found that um, in 2010, it was the hottest summer in 50 years, two months before the outbreak. They had had a broke breakdown in the sanitation because of the earthquake. In addition, very interestingly, um, it, the, the um, um, the geology of Haiti is such that it's an alkaline stone structure. And so with the earthquake, it ground up and the rivers became quite alkaline. For those of you who work with Vibrio cholerae, know that how you isolate it is to use a very high pH of about eight or so, um, or, or actually 10, higher. Um, you use a high pH and a warm temperature, and that's how you enrich for the bacterium. But the other factor that was very important is that that year, 2010, was the heaviest rainfall in 50 years. So the concatenation of all these factors came together. And um, we have done some retrospective studies. We, that was uh, the study that was uh, for 2010. But then in 2015, Hurricane Matthew went uh, through the uh, Caribbean. And we used that as an occasion to use our model to predict the highest risk uh, one could expect um, in, um, in Haiti. 
And uh, the model is shown on the left, and then the little uh, dark red uh, is, are the actual cases. So here's where we could predict the highest risk for cholera, and pretty much we're, we're spot on as to where the intense outbreak uh, following the Hurricane Matthew occurred. But then we did a study uh, in Yemen uh, in 2017, uh, because that was actually has turned out to be the worst outbreak, I think, historically. Um, and so we did our model analysis uh, predicting where um, the cases would be. That's the blue uh, map. And then the uh, um, tan map shows where the actual cases occurred. Now, this was we published this, and it was picked up by Scientific American. And we got a phone call in, the, in uh, 2018, in January, from the um, British aid agency, DFID, asking if we could work with them, if we would predict in 2018 where the cholera cases would be, they would then place the physicians, the supplies, um, and the medical uh, personnel uh, in that location. So that's how we worked together, and indeed in 2018, the incidence of cholera was, was severely less. Now we can't take credit for all of it, but. But by virtue of being able to locate physicians and supplies, this certainly, certainly made, a, made, a, made a difference. And so the model then is now being used um, routinely in uh, Yemen. We provide a monthly uh, prediction map uh, to DFID, and they use that to place the physicians and be prepared for outbreaks. And we're now uh, working with them to expand the, uh, the kind of predictive capacity to Africa. Let me switch briefly to um, climate change. Uh, here's an interesting story. We, we published this um, a couple of years ago. It was um, interesting work that citizen science contributed to it. Southampton Marine Station, 45 years ago, decided that they would archive plankton. And so they gave these plankton nets to um, cruising ship captains, to um, uh, yachtsmen, uh, to ferry boat captains that went back and forth in the British uh, uh, English Channel. And, and then uh, they collected from other stations marked in red in these little squares um, in the North Atlantic, at various places, and those uh, every year, those plankton were collected. And so, what we did in a team um, with a colleague, Dr. Carla Pruzzo at University of Genoa in Italy, and her team, and then with the Max Planck Institute, the uh, molecular biology team there, Southampton, where they had the the plankton, and then our team in Maryland, we went back with probes and we extracted DNA from all of those samples <clears throat> that had been collected 40 years ago, 30 years ago, et cetera. And we probed them with these specific probes for Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio parahemolyticus, and Vibrio vulnificus. These are human pathogens. And we were able to show with sea surface temperature, the numbers were increasing in the different areas, uh, in the North Atlantic and in England. But more to the point, we were able to show that the there was a correlation with the increases in the cases of these infections, Vibrio vulnificus, parahemolyticus, and a few cases of cholera. Cholera is not a major problem in England and in, in Western Europe. Uh, but the other two, Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio vulnificus, are in fact uh, pathogens of, of higher incidence. So we were able to show, essentially, I think this is probably the first evidence of an infectious disease, a human infectious disease, related to climate change because of the warming of the sea surface temperature, the increase in the numbers of vibrios because of the warmer temperature, evidenced by the archives um, of the plankton, which we were able to extract DNA and then be able to enumerate and show this correlation. So I think that this is another very important aspect of the environment and human infectious disease. Let me switch now to some of the more recent work, which is really exciting. Um, not that the other isn't, but this is fun to do. And that is uh, looking at the genomics of uh, Vibrio cholerae. Um, I've sort of lived through all of the revolution that has occurred, in fact, I wrote the first computer program uh, in 1960 as an undergraduate, uh, working 
uh, on putting together phenotype data. We didn't have genetic data or genome data at the time, but, but by studying at that time, I was looking at Pseudomonas aeruginosa and looking at what it could do, ferment sugars and grow in gelatin and all that sort of thing, and coded it, and then able to calculate relationships. So we called it numerical taxonomy, but it's a precursor to the bioinformatics that we do today. Now, we sequenced uh, Vibrio cholerae in 2000. This was done in collaboration with Craig Benner and uh, Claire Frazier and uh, John Michelanos at Harvard and our team at Maryland. And we confirmed what Jim Caper, my uh, former student, had shown by, by classical genetics that there probably were two chromosomes. And indeed, uh, Vibrio cholerae does have two chromosomes and others have shown that the small chromosome has too many housekeeping genes, so when you cure it, in quotation marks, of the small chromosome, the organism then cannot replicate. But in any case, we sequenced the bacterium, but since then, uh, and because of the fact that as director of the National Science Foundation, I chaired uh, what was then a classified committee. It was an advisory committee to the FBI and the CIA, and we worked with, with the FBI and the CIA using genomics to track down the perpetrator. It took us um, six years to gather the data, and I thought, you know, this is crazy. We really ought to be able to identifications rapidly. So we configured algorithms that would allow us to take DNA extracted uh, from any kind of sample, food, water, whatever, and uh, to be able to take the DNA sequences that we got um, from any sequencer, it's, um, it's, um, um, any sequencer can work. Uh, it's agnostic, it can be um, Illumina or ion torrent or whatever. And so with the raw sequence reads, we have built up this huge library, 160,000 curated genomes of bacteria, viruses, uh, fungus and protists. So that allows us to identify everything uh, within minutes once we've got the, um, um, the sequence. So that uh, allows us to identify the organism, but also to identify the genes that are carried by those organisms for met metabolic traits, for pathogenicity, for antibiotic resistance, and that allows us then to characterize the whole population, the microbial population, uh, as to the viruses, the protists, the uh, fungus, and the bacteria. But what's really important is that <clears throat> we're trying very hard now to understand the interaction of the host microbiome as well as the microbial uh, microbiome. And so trying to work the, the connections between the, the systems of the bacterial community and the host uh, DNA. But um, the interesting thing is that we're able to identify down to species and strain and substrain. And this is critical, uh, and we're the only ones, we've, we've competed with a number of other um, uh, uh, algorithms, um, uh, Metaplan and uh, many others, and we're able to identify down to strain. Why is this important? Um, it's critical, I think, for those of you in the audience who um, um, uh, work with, um, with microorganisms. In the case of Lactobacillus um, casei, uh, that species, one strain is used to make cheese, another strain is used to make Chardonnay wine, and a third is used to um, make yogurt. So strain does matter. And for physicians, strain matters a lot. Um, e. coli strains in our gut, all of us have E. coli in our gut, give us, um, produce vitamins and, and uh, protect against pathogens. But if we're unlucky to have strain 0157H7, uh, that's bad news uh, in terms of what it can do to our gut. Let me give you an example of why this, and this is a water example, of why this is important. Uh, working with um, Ashok Chopra, a very good scientist at the University of Texas in Austin, um, uh, he isolated from a uh, victim, a young woman who built herself a zip line, and uh, the zip line broke, she fell in the water, uh, developed uh, necrotizing cellular fasciitis, Time was wasted looking streptococcus. It turned out that there were four isolates of Aeromonas. Three were clonal, and a fourth was um, a separate strain. 
Uh, we injected all four strains into the muscle of mice, and to our surprise, because we can identify strain, one strain went to the liver and spleen. Now, in the case of the human victim, uh, uh, she first uh, had the leg infection, ended up with one leg amputated. It went systemic. The second leg had to be amputated. And then eventually, she lost both arms to the elbow. She did survive. Um, but the question is, why did it go systemic? And it, um, first of all, we figured, you know, if we tried to publish this, that there was something going on between these strains, probably a reviewer would give us hassle. So what we did was engineer the one strain that went to the spleen and the liver to be canamycin resistant and bioluminescent. And then we repeated the experiment in the one strain that went through was canamycin resistant and bioluminescent. So the ability to identify the strain and to show that it was one strain that went uh, systemic, we were able to prove using um, the biotechnology. And to make a very long story short, it turns out that uh, by itself, one strain can migrate, but not very well. And the other strain that did go to the spleen and liver normally does not. Uh, it stays in the muscle. But what happens is that together, the one strain um, that doesn't go through the liver, to the spleen and liver, when with the strain that is present, it turns out that second strain produces an exotoxin, breaks down the tissue of the muscle, and then allows that other strain to migrate to the liver and spleen. So uh, this, I think, is telling evidence that we need, really need to understand strain uh, function, but more to the point, polymicrobial infections. And I think we now have reached a stage of sophistication where Koch's postulates have been superb for 100 years, where you isolate the pathogen, and then you replicate it in a given model, and then you show that it is the pathogen. Now, I think we need to understand that microorganisms work together, and that it's the mix of microorganisms that play a role in many um, infections. And this, I think, um, this demonstration, uh, which has been published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science Journal, um, I think is a very good example of understanding interactions amongst microorganisms causing infections. Now, I've become intrigued by the microbiome, as have almost everybody else in the world uh, these days. But we were able to do a study, again, of cholera patients, in, um, in this case, in Calcutta. And working with the team in Calcutta, we're just now writing this up, um, they did all the classical tests, tedious tests for bacteria, the, the, the cell tests for viruses and fungus and, and uh, parasites. Um, and they extracted the DNA and sent it to us blinded. And then we did our analyses. And we got the samples in three phases. The first phase, they provided us with um, about nine samples where they knew Vibrio cholerae was present because this was a cholera hospital, the National uh, Hospital for Cholera and Enteric Diseases, NYSED. And, um, but then they also, in second tranche of samples, they couldn't figure out what was present, what was present in these patients coming in that obviously had the symptoms of cholera, but, but they couldn't isolate Vibrio cholera. Um, and then they also had some volunteers, probably the medical students, there's always medical students who are the volunteers, who provided samples. These were healthy individuals and provided stool samples. So we did the analyses. They had all the data uh, by the classical test. And then we did our analyses. It was fascinating, because in the upper left, um, where they knew Vibrio cholerae was present, yes, we picked up Vibrio cholerae, but we also picked up lots of enteropathogenic E. coli, and a little bit of salmonella, a little bit of shigella, and a little bit of campylobacter. So it was, these were mixed infections. Um, but then for the unknown, where they couldn't isolate Vibrio cholerae, we picked up really not Vibrio cholerae, we agreed with them, but we picked up mostly uh, enteropathogenic, uh, hemorrhagic, et cetera, E. coli, the E. coli family, plus some Salmonella, Shigella, and some of the other enteric pathogens. But interestingly, the pink area represents 
most of the pathogens, in this case, just the bacteria. We also have the other data for the viruses and the, and the uh, protists and fungus. But the pink area, notice in the healthy control, that's the bottom, I guess it would be your left. Um, the healthy controls carry a larger number of pathogens than we Westerners. Now, the bottom right is what we downloaded from the uh, NIH human microbiome data set. And some of us do carry a very few pathogens, but not enough either to make us sick. But what was very interesting, in the healthy controls in India, they can tolerate a, a larger number of pathogens. We'd always suspected that, but now we, we have the evidence for it. Um, what's very interesting, again, you can see the line down the middle is the um, identification of all the species, bacterial species, uh, in the human Western uh, group. And then you can see how varied within the Indian population, and that's because they represent a lot of ethnic derivatives as well as different um, diets. And so it's a much, much more dispersed population, whereas we have a, in the Western uh, Hemisphere, fairly similar diet and therefore a very characteristic uh, microbiome. Um, the antibiotic resistance uh, was widely distributed amongst both the healthy, uh, the um, a disease of cholera patients and the non-cholera patients. And that's because in India, uh, antibiotics are available without prescription. In fact, you can get it from antibiotics from street peddlers. So very likely, there's a lot of self-treating going on, hence a lot of antibiotic resistance in the gut flora of the Indian patients. Um, we've, I've become very intrigued um, by the human microbiome globally. So we've collected all of the data that are publishable at the time we did this analysis. And this is, I guess you'd call it, the median human microbiome with respect to uh, um, the various components that comprise the human microbiome. In this case, the pink don't represent pathogens. This is simply a distribution of all of the uh, microorganisms. But what's very interesting is that when you look country by country, this becomes a useful bioforensic tool because, again, it's culturally related to diet, uh, cultural patterns, um, et cetera. So uh, this, I think, is fascinating because it becomes a public health tool. Um, because we can identify uh, protists as well as, uh, that is, parasites, as well as uh, fungus and uh, viruses, it allows us then to, be to determine the incidence in samples collected country-wise um, and to be able to track, I think, public health um, a mechanism to be able to track uh, pathogen distribution. So I think this approach, I think, coupled with the satellite predicting the conditions that epidemics will break out, give us a whole new perspective on public health in the 21st cent century. And then let me just comment about um, water itself, because I've become very interested working with um, the, in this case, we worked with the Orange County, California um, uh, Water District. Uh, it turns out that if you are in uh, Los Angeles and drink the water, 50% of it came from the sewage plant. Now, before you gasp and clutch your throat, let me just say that the um, sludge from the sewage plant goes to sea. The water comes in to uh, current, uh, the Orange County drinking water plant, and it goes through this tremendous treatment. Uh, first, it's, um, it's filtered uh, with coarse filters. Then it goes through a sodium hypochlorite, then a microfiltration. Uh, then it goes through reverse osmosis. Uh, then it goes through a whole series of other treatments, um, including chlorination before distribution. But because um, they want to be absolutely certain, that water that comes through at the end is drinkable, it's potable. But to be certain, they have been uh, uh, trickling it over a wetlands. And then three months later, they draw down, and then that's what's distributed. But because of the drought, conditions, they really needed to get the water to the population faster. And the question was, was it safe enough to drink as it came out at the very end? And the answer is yes. The work that we did shows that um, initially, uh, 
that gray area of just all kinds of bacteria, including a few um, um, pathogens, but mostly opportunistic pathogens, but not many of the um, human pathogens, a lot of E. coli. But by the time it gets through reverse osmosis, it's mostly water bacteria. It's mostly the kind of iron bacteria and sulfur bacteria that we have in our gut anyway. Uh, and similarly for viruses, um, the same thing. We find that the human viruses only, um, that we find them only in the very beginning in the water coming in, but by the time it gets out uh, at the end, the only viruses we pick up are bacteriophages, and they're not pathogenic for humans. Um, this, be, this then becomes a very useful uh, confirmation um, for the safety. But one other point I'd like to make is that there's a concern, there was a concern, that by mixing the sewage uh, bacterial population, there might be transmission, uh, because they have a lot of antibiotic resistance, to the natural water bacteria. But that turns out not to be the case, because we were able to monitor the antibiotic resistance genes, and we found that by the time they even get through reverse osmosis, not many of the genes uh, for antibiotic resistance are still present. So that, that fear, um, I think, was unwarranted. Um, and then now we've been looking at um, drinking water. Um, it's kind of interesting, because of all that bottled water we drink, um, is it safe? The answer is, of course, yes. Uh, but we looked at um, uh, sparkling natural mineral water from a spring, um, bottled water from a variety, variety of uh, supermarkets, artesian well water, um, some reprocessed water, um, and um, tap water um, from the University of Maryland. Don't let the university know that we tested it, but anyway. And then uh, some drinking fountain water. This was at the Supreme Court. So if they act a little irascible, it's because of the water they drink. No, I'm just joking. Um, so the question is, um, yeah, it does differ in the population. When you look at the microbiomes, um, that little blue dot is uh, it's, uh, sparkling natural artesian well water. And then down in the green are the, um, um, are the uh, uh, bottled water. And then off uh, to the left, the little red star and the triangle, that's drinking fountain water. And then when we um, looked at the um, the, the array of microorganisms, they do vary, so the populations. I, I don't give numbers here. We're just looking at what kind of bacteria are present, what kind of viruses. And I must say, for viruses, we didn't pick up human viruses, just a lot of bacteriophages, um, and occasionally a, a fungus. Um, but when we look at the microbiota, uh, only rarely, we picked up one, sal one a uh, bottle that did have a salmonella, but at very, very low concentration, uh, just detectable by our very sensitive techniques. And a mycobacterium in a drinking fountain water, uh, probably because of the, uh, the fountain itself, whether it had been cleaned or not, who knows. Um, but uh, virulence genes, we were able to detect, and this is useful because it confirmed the identification of the microorganisms. Where we had picked up a Klebsiella, we indeed found that uh, genes associated with Klebsiella were present, similarly for Pseudomonas and um, for other microorganisms. Um, bacteriophages were detectable, but again, this served as a confirmation of the bacteria that we had picked up um, by the uh, analysis of the bacterial genomes. Um, so the conclusion really is that the predominant species were members of the uh, tinobacteria and proteobacteria um, that were harmless. Um, sparkling natural mineral water um, had mainly the methylversatilis and methyl the kinds of methylbacterium that you would find in, in uh, in an um, in, in environmental system, harmless, not pathogenic. It was only the tap water. We picked up uh, occasionally um, a salmonella or a propiobacterium, and that may well be associated with whether or not the drinking water fountain was properly cleaned. But in any case, I think uh, it's interesting to notice that the bacteria that are present in water are mainly the common um, uh, iron, sulfur, methyl bacteria. 
And so the hypothesis that I'm developing at the moment that we're testing is that in our natural gut flora, we do carry a lot of these iron bacteria and sulfur bacteria, and we've been sort of wondering why. And I suspect that it's a matter of evolution that we as humans have been drinking from river streams, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, that were not treated, weren't methyl, it weren't uh, chlorinated or anything, and that we have in fact adopted and uh, adapted in our gut the kind of water bacteria that we have been constantly drinking. So that's an hypothesis. We're in the process of, of developing that. Um, Obviously, the, it's clear that culture methods are now obsolete. We really do need to use DNA approaches, and uh, whole genome DNA seems to be, at the, for, for the moment, the best and the most accurate technique. And this approach we've taken allows us to analyze the viruses, fungus, and protists, as well as the bacteria, and it's now time that we can consider, we're doing a lot of work uh, in another whole lecture that I don't have time to give on doing studies with um, various kinds of post-operative infections and so forth. And we do find that they are polymicrobial and very often an anaerobes, which are very hard to culture. Now, let me conclude by pointing out that I've done most of my work in Bangladesh. And we've, I've described using satellites, uh, microbiomes, DNA, but how could, because they've been so wonderful in working with the villagers in Bangladesh over the years, how could we take this science and provide them with an advantage? They're not going to have circulated, chlorinated water, unfortunately, probably not even in my lifetime, maybe not even your lifetime for you youngsters, uh, students. So we took the science and we thought, okay, look, um, the bacteria, the cholera bacteria, are associated with plankton. They're kind of the elephants of the microbial world. They're 200 micrometers in size. The bacteria are 20 or 10 or 5. So if we use sericlob, well, we, if we could filter the water and get rid of the plankton, we could then reduce cholera. So we tried a whole lot of different materials that would be as available to the least uh, the most poverty-struck uh, uh, family in the village is in the remote villages. We tried men's t-shirt, didn't work very well. We tried very expensive uh, Chinese poplin cloth that you could get in Bangladesh, it's expensive, didn't work very well. But we tried sari cloth, and if you folded it four or five times, it made a really nice 20 micron mesh filter. We checked it by electron microscopy. And we submitted a proposal to NIH um, to do the study, and we cut back horrible reviews that said men will never drink water that has gone through a used sari cloth worn by a woman. Well, okay, um, but they said if you will, and also you have no preliminary data. So the, um, we went to um, a foundation, uh, and they very nicely gave us $100,000 to go in and do a preliminary. And the first thing we learned was that men used sari cloth to remove flies from their beer. So much for the reviewers. So for students in the audience, when you get a crazy review, uh, just take the good reviews, go back and resubmit. Anyway, we resubmitted the proposal, and the NIAID said it was a good project, but it wasn't, uh, how do they put it, technical? What they meant was it wasn't very sophisticated. And they said, try the nursing institute. So they lateraled it over to the nursing institute. Thank you, Nursing Institute, they funded us. So we did a three-year study where we instructed the women to go out to the villages. We had sort of extension agents, uh, and they went out to the village, the remote villages every week and would explain to them why, how to filter, uh, to fold the cloth, and then when you're finished, you rinse it, put it in the sunlight because that acts as a kind of disinfectant. And um, the, the women, were very amenable. In fact, um, uh, the success of the program was very clear because you could see the clarity. Now, the water wasn't as clear as we would be drinking, but it certainly was free of things that swim. Um, and so it became very obvious to the women that this was um, better water for their children. And we were able to reduce um, 
uh, the cholera in the in the villages by 50 percent by this very simple technique. Now the question was, was it sustainable? So we went back five years later, and we had laid out an experimental plan. I had a, a very good statistical team working with us, and um, we had had control villages where we did not instruct. Um, we simply went out and talked to them about how they need to clean the kaloshes that they collected the water in. And then we had the test villages. Uh, but we, when we went back five years later, the control villages had found out about filtering. So everybody was filtering. Um, but what we did discover, which was really an important, um, important point, was that there was a herd effect. So that if, if members of a village, for some reason too lazy or whatever, didn't filter, they were surrounded by families who did filter, and therefore they were protected. So we did, we were able to discern that and publish that. Indeed, it was sustainable, and it, it did have an effect uh, even on those who did not filter. So I'll just con conclude by thanking a whole lot of people from the ICDDRB, from NYSED, um, students, postdocs, visiting scientists from the University of Maryland, and um, colleagues, particularly Dr. Huck, who has worked with me for 40 years. He's now a professor in his own right at the University of Maryland. Antar Jutla, who's the brilliant guy behind the uh, modeling and the satellite work. And uh, Sion Young Choi, who uh, built the database for the metagenomics. And uh, Dr. Hassan, who's brilliant. He's uh, the informaticist and the microbiologist. So. Um, Water remains really a global challenge. We all need to understand that it is in short supply and it is the gold or the oil of our future. So uh, I like the words of John Muir. When one tugs at a single na thing in nature, he and I inserted and she, um, find it hitched to the rest of the universe. And so I thank you for your attention.